Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to two vital CBT techniques I always use for depression. How to work with the unconscious and conscious mind to change depressive thought patterns. It's a soul-crushing hellhole. I feel glued down by it. I can see people outside having a life laughing and loving, and that makes it worse. For me, it's all hopeless, useless and pointless. It's like I'm destined for a miserable kind of annihilation. I feel lethargic and terrified at the same time. I might look okay, but on the inside, I'm screaming. That's how Kathy, a client, described her depression during her first session with me. In this uh, video, I'm going to give you two CBT techniques for depression, which are closely related under the cognitive reframes umbrella. The first actually works quite unconsciously for the client, while the second helps educate the conscious mind in new, more flexible thought patterns. And together, these two techniques can have major benefits for depressed clients. One thing's for sure, more of us need to know how to effectively treat depression than ever before. The depressed generation. Depression is ravaging the modern world. It's life-sapping impact. It's felt by hundreds of millions and it's now recognized as the number one disorder of modern life. See reference one. According to the World Health Organization, who, 300 million people are affected by depression at any one time. But the current depression stats get even more depressing. What's happening to our young people. Depression is striking increasingly younger people, even children. See reference two and three. Many more teens are now regularly consuming antidepressants. See reference four. The proportion of people becoming depressed is now 10 times greater than in 1945. See reference five. So depression is on the rise in all age groups, but mostly in the young. And it seems there's something about our lives now that is causing widespread harm. We, you and I need to help stem the tide so that future generations are healthier and happier. Cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, has long been seen as a useful tool in helping lift depression, but weirdly, its reputation seems to be sinking. CBT is only half as effective as it used to be for depression. Uh, through a meta-analysis of 70 studies between 1977 and 2014, psychological researcher Tom Johnson and Odgier Freeberg drew a strange conclusion. Cognitive behavioral therapy is now around half as effective in treating depression as it used to be. See reference six. And this makes sense in the context that depression thrives on negative rumination. See reference seven and expectation. In the early days of CBT, depression sufferers would have likely had high hopes for its effectiveness. But as the novelty of CBT has worn off and reports have emerged questioning its effectiveness, the positive expectation or placebo effect may have fallen away a bit. Half of CBT's initial effectiveness in the treatment of depression may have been purely due to the sense of hope it generated in those being treated. And hope is an antidote to depression, perhaps the most powerful antidepressant of all. Knowing how to generate hope in depressed clients is a vital therapeutic skill. So, even among people prone to rumination or misuse of the imagination, the usual depressing effects of rumination can be mitigated when they ruminate with hope. See reference eight. So even mulling over stuff a lot, but if you do it with hope, won't cause depression. I've written about what we really have to include when treating any depressed person before. I've also written about the limitations of the cognitive behavioral model, but I'll just reiterate briefly why the use of CBT in isolation can never successfully treat emotional problems. Putting the cart before the horse. The crux of the problem with some CBT-based approaches is that strong emotions most often arise not after we have thoughts, but before we have them. See reference nine. Thoughts are more often a reflection of feelings, especially powerful feelings, than the cause of those feelings. So it's more effective 
to change feelings in order to, to then change thoughts than the other way around. That's not to say that changing thoughts can't change feelings, but when the emotions are really powerful, our clients can feel swamped by them. And it can be hard to think anything at all when we're caught in the frenzied grip of intense feeling. To put it metaphorically, how can we expect to clear scattered leaves when the wind is still whipping about us in a hurricane? The whipping winds of the psyche. You can sweep your pathway until kingdom comes, but if the wind won't let up, the leaves will only come swirling back. When the wind, excuse my heavy-handed use of metaphor here, dies down and everything becomes calm again, that's when we can get everything in order. When the mind is calm, then we can examine and widen the context of thinking. But it's much easier to let the wind die down first before we do that. There are more neural connections leading from the emotional centers of the brain to the cognitive centers than vice versa. We know this from the research of neuroscientists such as Joseph Le Ledoux. See reference 10. This basic tenet of neuroscience contradicts the principles of classical CBT, though to be fair, many CBT practitioners are incorporating mindfulness and clinical hypnosis into their practice so that they can reach uh, more parts of the mind, in a sense. So we must always remember that when feelings are powerful, as they certainly are in depression, we need to work to calm these feelings first and foremost with some of our clients. But once the mind is sufficiently calm, then we have a chance to help the depressed client widen their context by seeing reality above and beyond the usual depressive thinking biases. Then, and only then, we can help the client get into the habit of generating non-depressing causes for life events and therefore get them thinking differently. And this will have an impact on emotions. So calming the emotions, thinking differently, thinking differently will affect the emotions. So how does an effective CBT technique actually work? It depends on how you see it. Whenever we help a depressed client view their reality differently, we're applying a therapeutic reframe. In a sense, all CBT techniques can work as reframes, but it's vital to understand something about reframes. Reframes are not just cognitive. A reframe happens as an experience in the client's mind. It's not simply a matter of logical deduction or reasoning. The client needs to feel as well as think that the new way of seeing is more true than the old depressing way, or not necessarily more true, but wider, a wider perspective. We need to know how to deliver reframes with emotional impact, but of course we also need to ensure they make perfect logical sense as well as instinctive and emotional sense. So always bear in mind that trying to change thoughts while strong emotions still dictate those thoughts may not work. We may need to change a client's emotional state before widening their cognitive context through a reframe. We need to deliver the cognitive reframe in such a way that it appeals directly to feelings as much as thoughts. It has a visceral emotional impact. Beliefs are powerful. Some people are prepared to die for their beliefs. Depressed people hold very strong beliefs, emotionally driven beliefs as to how bad things are and how other people treat them badly and how the future is hopeless and so forth. The more we directly oppose someone's strong beliefs, the more they'll tend to protect and cling to those beliefs, even when those beliefs damage them. So with this in mind, I like to use CBT techniques subtly. Don't use a spray gun when a paintbrush will do. We need never ask a client, why don't you look at it like this? Trying to force people to see something a different way can trigger the rubber band effect in which the tension of being pulled one way increases the desire to move fast in the opposite direction, no matter how well intentioned the intervention. It has been found though, that simply asking questions can be a wonderful way of helping people discover new ways of seeing for themselves, as with Socratic questioning. Okay, so CBT technique for depression number one, use reflective reframing. It's important to feed back what a client has said to us, both to check our understanding and also to build and maintain rapport with them. But don't forget that your depressed client is giving you not only factual information, but also emotional interpretation. They will be describing and explaining to you 
how they see things using their own explanatory styles. And this gives you a window into their way of thinking. So as a recap, an explanatory style is the way a person explains situations and events to themselves, consciously or perhaps unconsciously. So depressed people tend to firstly globalize negativity. The bad event is specific, but to the depressed person, everything is ruined. They take one bad thing and they spread it to cover the whole of their reality. I failed my maths test, my whole life is crap. She wouldn't go out with me, nobody likes me. My relationship ended, nothing ever goes right. So one situation or event is extrapolated to cover all situations or events. This thinking style is often driven by feeling hopeless, and of course, makes people in turn feel more hopeless. As with all thinking styles, it can also be picked up from other people. Okay. Two, internalized negativity. The cause of the bad event is assumed to be mainly or entirely due to the depressed person's core identity. Possible external causes for the negative event are minimized or remain entirely unperceived. You know, for example, my marriage ended, I screw everything up. Why does it always happen to me? So something about the badness of me that causes bad things in life to happen. They seem in a bad mood. It must be something that I've done. This is just my luck. Conversely, it's also common for depressed people to overly externalize the causes of their misfortune, sort of exaggerating the role of other people and therefore blaming them. This is depressing because it entails lack of control and feeling powerless is depressing. So it's, it's their fault. It's my parents' fault. It's society's fault. Okay. Three, stabilize negatives. Bad things are seen as permanent or stable. Nothing has ever worked out for me. I'll never get better. Okay. I'll never meet new, someone new. It's always the same. Okay. The bad thing is seen as permanent as well as pervasive. But positive parts of life, on the other hand, are seen as temporary and fragile. Too good to last. Yeah, the relationship's great at the moment, but what worries me is it's too good to last. These emotionally driven classic depressive thinking styles can be quite entrenched with people. Rather than trying to argue a client out of using them, we can be subtle and simply feed back to the client the heart of what they've said using a non-depressive explanatory style. In this way, cognitive reframing can be not just subtle, but even unconscious. We're showing them, not telling them. The client will know that the way you fed back what they told you is different somehow, but this may not even be uh, registered at a conscious level. Example one. So the client might say, um, my whole life is just a total mess. So that's very negatively global, isn't it? So you might feed that back to them. You, you might say, so you haven't yet got the things that you need from life. So it's non-stable and it's specific in the way that you feed it back. So we fed back the heart of what they've said to us, but in such a way that we're time limiting the misery and implying more specificity as regards their dissatisfactions. Example two, the client might say something like, nothing ever works out for me. I screw up everything. So that's global and stable and internal as to do with negatives. So you might feed back to them. Okay, so what are the things specifically that haven't worked out in the past? What specific things have been mistakes in your view? Okay, so that's taking all the depressive explanatory style out of the feedback. Example three, the client might say, my life is just totally unbearable. And you might say, what specific things are the worst things about your life at the moment? So at the moment is time limited, specific is non-global. So we're starting to reframe de depressive thoughts in a way that isn't forced or obvious. We're not arguing with the client's perceptions, simply widening the context a little bit at a time. Next, we can start to work more directly with their conscious understanding of how depressive thinking has been blighting them. CBD technique for depression two, describe the pattern of depressive thought. Once your client has had the opportunity to feel the moderating effects of the way you feed back what they're telling you on their depressive thinking, okay, then you can help them examine the nature of depressive thinking on a more conscious level. So we can help our client see their pattern of depressive thought bias from the outside, as it were, 
and therefore see that it is a way of perceiving reality, not just how things are in reality. Start to recognize all or nothing extremist thinking in themselves and start to generate more flexible thought. Rather than saying, you're prone to depressive thinking, your explanatory styles are depressing, we don't have to mention any of that. We can again be more subtle. Many people going through depression find they think in very specific ways. Does any of this sound familiar? You can then describe the depressive explanatory styles, global, internal, stable for bad things, specific, external and unstable for good events. You may find your client nodding. You might say, does any of this sound familiar to the way that you've been seeing things in absolutist all or nothing terms? It can be a massive relief for depressed clients to actually see some of the patterns of what they've been doing and puts a fence around the whole experience. We're not talking about them doing it, we're talking about lots of people do this, it's just something you do. So they can make the jump. We can then give them tasks to start spotting within themselves when they're using depressive thinking styles. And of course, simply looking at a client's cognition never constitutes a complete treatment for depression. We need to look for any signs of trauma that may have been locking the depression in place and deal with, with um, that if necessary. We need to look at how the client is living now and how well their primal emotional needs are being met in life and help them meet those needs healthily if necessary. This will include encouraging them to behave in ways that help them switch off emotional loops. Intrinsically satisfying tasks with the beginnings, middles and ends tends to do that. Minimize inward focus and rumination that fuels depression and help meet their needs for community and meaning. We need to look at the connection between sleep and depression and help them understand the role of overdreaming in the onset and maintenance of depression. But within my comprehensive depression treatment approach, I always use these two CBT techniques as really helpful tools. Remember Kathy from the start of this video when I was talking about, in her fifth session she said, I'm now seeing that the way I was looking at life was just that, a way of looking, but not how life actually is or ever need be again. And that was music to my ears. So I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge. And if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unc dot com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. And thanks for watching.